Hey everybody, welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. I'm Brianna, and who are you? I'm Courtney. Woo! That's We're me. We're here. Welcome to another episode of Murder Dictionary Podcast. Welcome. Before we get into the case that we've got for tonight, let's cover a few things going on. We've got social media, if you want to follow us over there. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can email us. We're everywhere. We're everywhere, just Murder Dictionary. That's right. So look for us. We are easily found. If you want to read more about the cases that we cover each episode, you'll always find links to the sources in our show notes. So if you want to go ahead and follow up and read a little bit more beyond what the research we did, then check those out. And we also sometimes include links to some resources for some mental health issues, anti-bullying, suicide hotline, stuff like that. So if this brings up anything for you, if you just want to get more information, you can check out those links. We also have the links to our thread list if you want to get some merch items. Christmas is on its way. It is fast approaching. It's a coming. So if you know another Murder Dictionary fan and you want to give them some Murder Dictionary merch for the holidays then yeah, check out our Threadless. I believe it's Threadless slash Murder Dictionary. I think so. Yeah, I will say that that I got the hoodie like a year ago now. It is one of the most comfortable pieces of clothing I own. Yeah. I just have to say that. Court rocks that hoodie. A lot. A lot. Yeah. And hoodie season is back, so I expect to see it more often now. I think it's time for a new one. It's it's pretty haggard, but (laughs) it's the most comfortable thing I own. So what are you going to do? And if you want to get access to some bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and a bunch of extra perks, you can check out our Patreon. Our Patreon page is at patreon.com slash murder dictionary. So we've got a few new people that are patrons from this week. So we wanted to say thank you to Kimberly, Charmaine, Martha, that's my grandma's name, Martha, and Kat. Thank you. So thanks, you guys. We appreciate you being on our Patreon. And again, if you want to get access to all those perks, then check out patreon.com slash murder dictionary. With all that said, I think unless you have any other announcements, we can start diving into the case. I don't know what I could possibly announce right now. (laughs) So we are talking again about letter killers. So we're on letter L, and this is a perfect time for us to bring up these murders that write letters to victims, families, and the media. So that's what we're diving into for these episodes. Such a bizarre thing to do, but it's so interesting how many of them do this. Yeah, it's really common. And we talked a little bit last week about the psychology for why people do that and the kind of notoriety and fame they're seeking and controlling the narrative and feeling like they're outsmarting the police and all that stuff. So if you missed that, that's in last episode in the beginning. I feel like Bill, this guy Bill, kind of falls into like a little bit of everything. Yeah. Like all the categories in a, in a weird way. Yeah, he's definitely motivated by a lot of attention seeking and yeah. feeling superior and smart and... I get that. So yes, today we are talking about William Hirons. Bill. Which goes by Bill. (laughs) He goes by Bill. He's William, you know, as his birth name, but definitely he's a Bill. So it's kind of interesting because when you think about serial killers, you think about, you know, Jack the Ripper, Ted Bundy's, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer's and stuff. But in the beginning of technically serial killers as the name came out. The name out. is coined, yeah. The quote unquote name is coined. Um it was like Jack the Ripper had the 1880s. Ed Gain kind of gets going in like the mid 50s. And so there's kind of this lull period of time between like the 30s and like you know late 40s. So technically William Hirons is one of the very first serial killers for that period of time, but it's a name that's not as 
notable as other names. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, he's not the first person you think of. Like you said, yeah. you, you know Jack the Ripper. You know Ed Richard Gang. Ramirez, you know. There's these definite high-profile mm-hmm. killers, and not a lot of people know about William Hirons. Yeah. But he definitely was one of the early serial killers, one of the first ones out there that were well-known. Once were it was famous. given a name. Exactly. He's one of the first. So Bill Hirons was born November 18th, 1928 in Evanston, Illinois, and he grew up in the Chicago suburb of Lincolnwood. Bill's parents, George and Margaret, were both children of immigrants originally from Luxembourg. Both of George and Margaret's families owned greenhouses and floral shops. So when they came over to America, they continued with the family business is working of florists, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, what happened was William's parents lost their business in 1929 once the Great Depression began. And people stop spending money on these kind of little extra things. Yeah, flowers are out. It didn't seem necessary to spend the money on flowers. After the family business was gone, Margaret mostly worked as a seamstress, while George took pretty much any job he could get. So he'd work random security jobs, bartending a little bit, or get any various temporary gig that would come his way. A lot of night jobs. And yeah, it was just like whatever is out there, you know, it doesn't matter if it's overnights or if it's late night at a bar, whatever brings in money. Bill had a younger brother, Jerry, and while their parents were constantly working, the boys were often left at home with babysitters. Most people in the neighborhood knew George as a drunk who spent way too much money at the bar. Makes me think he was sleeping it off during the day, and these are where the night jobs come in. Right. And then the kids are, of course, even more alone. So even when he's home, he's, like, sleeping off a hangover. So they're just really not having much interaction with their parents. It's very dark and very quiet. (laughs) His alcoholism caused George and Margaret to have prolonged volatile arguments. And his brother Jerry seemed to be able to cope with that and kind of tune it out and not really listen to or be affected by the constant fighting. But Bill, on the other hand, was deeply affected by the constant bickering between his parents. When his parents argued, Bill would actually leave the home and he'd walk around the neighborhood for hours at a time until he thought that enough time had passed that he could walk back and the argument would be over and the house would be quiet. At age 11, Bill saw a couple having sex, and when he told his mother, she told him that sex equals disease and it was a dirty act. And this information from his mom clearly stuck with Bill and deeply affected his perception. Kids are always listening. Always. And and just interpreting things differently than you might mean to. Yeah. And this wasn't a situation where he overheard something. This was his mom. And my imagination is getting in his face like, it's dirty. It's wrong. That's how you get disease. Like, really... Clo- like, you know, close talking to him and really trying to uh, impress upon him how disgusting sex is. She's thinking she's doing the right thing and like keeping him s- safe. Yeah. Scaring him from it. He's not going to be promiscuous, you know, all these things. But he is interpreting it completely different. Maybe any other kid, maybe little Jerry, his brother was just like, oh, it's cool. Like, I understand, mom. I got you. Not with Bill. No, it really, really affected his perception very severely, and it scarred him. I mean, it really changed him. So, like, later on, when he very first kissed a girl, he became so panicked that he threw up in front of the girl and began crying. That's, like, the saddest thing. He's just so affected. And then imagine being the little girl, too, on the flip side of this, where you're just like, what? 
the hell? Yeah, this was probably, you know, another young kid. It may have been her first kiss, too. Oh, wait, this is what kissing is like? Oh, my God. Come it. on. I'm not going to kiss someone for the end of time. He threw up on me and started crying. Right. This is not how this works. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, originally, I'm sure his mom was just trying to be like, hey, don't go too far. Don't go too promiscuous. Yeah. But... His pendulum and emotions just swung all the way in the opposite direction. And he was clearly completely disgusted by anything affectionate or sexual. Poor kid. Yeah, it it really, really fucked him up. At age 12, he worked as a delivery boy. And after an incident where he tried shortchanging a customer on purpose just so he could pocket the money... He became hooked on the thrill of stealing. And once these simple stealing scams lost their thrill, then he moved on to petty crime. Then, while taking his long walks, he got the idea to begin burglarizing homes. It's so just, like, arbitrary how it happens. He's just, you know, 12-year-old delivery boy. First of all, I remember 12. I was in sixth grade. I am not working a job like this. It's just different time, old timey. Definitely. And then, you know, he's just out there wandering around, getting away from his family already. And then this is where it just builds and grows. It's an escalation. There's the word. And that's the thing that we see in so many crimes. Like, it doesn't just go from zero to murder. There's peeping Tom in the middle. There's burglary in the middle. Whatever that is for each individual killer, this was his escalation. And it's an escalation that involves the thrill. He enjoys it. And also we've got underneath the thrill, the element of poverty, where obviously this is a time period where, yes, it's about possessions, but it's also about money. You know, people can't afford to buy expensive things. So if he can steal a fur coat, that's something that nobody else has. If he can steal a couple dollars, that means he can put extra food on the table, you know? Yeah. And just tell his parents like, oh, my paycheck was big. I worked a lot, you know, but actually he's stealing. But this just means they get to eat. It's that simple. You know, it's it was rough times. So I think he came about it in a way that maybe his very first scam was we need a loaf of bread, but then it escalated because he enjoyed it so much. Yes. You know. At the time, he always carried a heavy duty knife or a screwdriver with him. But he says that despite the fact that he liked guns, he usually didn't carry a gun with him. However, at the age of 13, he was caught carrying a loaded gun, and he was sent to the Jabalt School for Wayward Boys. During a subsequent search of his parents' home, police found multiple stolen weapons. But here's the thing. When they continued the search and expanded it to the roof of a nearby building, which seems strange that they would go there to begin with. There must have been something that tipped them off. I thought that same thing. Why would you even think to look there? Right. Oh, we're looking at this boy. However, let's look at the roof that's like across from them. Anyway, not even on their own building. It's worth pointing out that there must have been something. Yes. Or that he said, hey, I've got this stash, you know. But when they went to the building and they went up to the roof, police discovered that Bill had this collection of jewelry, furs, cameras, radios, and suits from all his previous burglaries. I just think it's so impressive that this 13-year-old has arranged his own storage unit. He's like evil smart. Yeah, I mean, really, this is this whole double life. His parents don't even know. You know, it's not like he's bringing this stuff home and he's like, hey, mom, here's a coat for you. Got you you a coat, mom, right? No, not at all. And it speaks to me of like, this is stuff he's not even using. If it's on the roof of another building, it's not even like he put the radio inside his room. It's something that he has to go out and visit his little stash. Yeah, it's just about the theft. 
it's about owning these items. Just taking stuff. You know, it's not like he can plug in the radio on the roof yeah. or wear the fur coat. He has nowhere that he's going that requires a suit, probably. He's 13. It's exciting. It's Yeah, it's just the thrill. Yeah. That's what that says to me. It's just about possessing these things, knowing he took them from someone else, and getting the rush of doing that. So he had been stealing more than just money for a while, clearly. And this meant he was just keeping the items instead of selling them. Because the other thing he could have done is take them to a pawn shop or sell them to someone or whoever he came across that he knew needed a new radio or whatever. Like, hey, man, I'll sell this to you cheap. So it wasn't necessarily just about money because he could have sold it and gotten more money. And they could have used it. Exactly. It was really clear he didn't need any of the items that he stole, and he was really just doing it for fun, which he would later admit. And he said that it very distinctly gave him a release of sexual tension to steal things from people. He would repeat this cycle many times of being caught for burglary or theft, then sent to boarding school, then get released, and then continue that cycle over and over. Eventually, he was arrested for theft and larceny and was sent to the St. Bede Academy for three years sentence. It's a long time. It is for someone so young. Mm -hmm. Especially, like, there's bigger things going on at this time period, you know, just in the environment that we're living in. And so to actually send him and sentence him to three years... That's that's pretty big. When he was sent to this facility, Bill actually thrived because it was a highly structured environment and it was run by Benedictine monks. So he had a lot of guidance and leadership and a lot of structure and it clearly was good for him. By age 16, he started excelling in math and science. His test scores were so high that the school staff encouraged him to apply to attend the University of Chicago. But after passing the entrance exams, he skipped senior year and he was able to start in the fall 1945 semester a year early, ahead of his class. He was really smart and they basically noticed and just was like, you know, hey, you can skip your last year of high school and just go straight to college. Not have to deal with this if you can score really high. And he did. Yeah. And that's a testament to how well he was doing with the structure. Yeah. You know, you think of this kid who's coming from a home with very absentee parents. They were busy. that were working all the time. Now he's got constant supervision, a bunch of other kids that he can be social with. He's got structure and boundaries and rules. And he's forced to go to class. And he does well. So, yeah, he he worked really hard and got into this school, which is awesome. He turned it all around, you know? Right. It's like, oh, he's doing great. Exactly. When he first got into college, he tried to live at home and then commute to the university. But this was way too difficult. So he moved into the dorms at Gates Hall. He was very popular at the university And his classmates considered him both handsome and smart, and he was actually known to be a fantastic dancer. He had a reputation with the ladies at the school. (laughs) I feel like in old-timey cases, that's kind of what dancer means. Like, if you're a guy that can dance, that means that you are dancing with a lot of ladies and getting a lot of kisses, apparently. And then puking puking on on him. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, your dance, his dance card was always full, I'm sure as the phrase goes. It quickly became apparent that Bill was not going to be able to afford school and live on the dorms on his own. The expense was just way too high for the cost of living plus the class cost. He worked as a docent at the school and also as an usher, but it still wasn't enough to make ends meet which is a point where it becomes really easy to make the decision to pick up burglary again. 
I'm sure, you know, it's it's one of those, you wonder how much did he really, like, put towards it, but it seems like he made a real attempt. But you'll never really know because he was never selling anything he stole anyway. So this isn't about money. And I like to think that he really did make, like, a real attempt at trying to go straight kind of thing, especially leaving the monks. That probably stuck because he was there for three years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he probably came out of it with a pretty good motivation, right? But did not last too long. So once he picked up burglarizing again, he'd often steal items of clothing, which he again says made him sexually aroused. When Bill was about 13, he began to feel that he had a split personality and that he shared his body with a person named George Merman, a personality inside him that was really the thief and the murderer. William's middle name is George, so it's speculated that that's where he got the name from. But it's really unknown where Merman, the last name, comes from. It is a very interesting name. Just George Merman. Just a regular person. It just sounds like a very boring name. An old-timey name, too. It sounds old-timey. It just, where did he come up with this? The George does make sense to me. It's his middle name. That's easy. Right. But George is super common, too, at the time. Yeah, but he just blamed it on this George Merman character that was in, that was who the real, you know, violent the trouble criminal maker. was. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Bill was not able to remember any of the things this other personality, George, had done. And this allowed him to continue just living a normal student's life by day while having a whole secret double life the rest of the time. Yeah, it's pretty convenient that you don't remember, sure. From here on, if there's any nefarious behavior happening, he claimed that George is perpetrating it, but it's really Bill who exists on paper in Chicago that's doing all these things. As I was going through this the whole time, I started... Going through, like, okay, this time he's Bill, and here he is as George, and it just became easy to just say, this is B as G. This is Bill as George. That was basically how I was referring to it the whole time. Yeah, and I don't really make a distinction. I'm I'm just Bill 100% of the time. Oh, yeah, no, it's Bill. Just because it's like, I don't know, I... Th- I want to believe people, but there was never any diagnosis, I feel like. It, it we'll just, get there. It do- yeah, it doesn't make sense. So I am just calling him Bill the entire time. And in my brain, every time I think of him, it's Bill. Yeah. George, to me, is just something that he's blaming. We can all point a finger at something. Yes. And that's for him. It's it's George. On June 3rd, 1945, 16-year-old Bill was attempting to burglarize the home of Josephine Ross. Josephine was a 43-year-old, twice-divorced widow who had lived with her two daughters in an apartment on Kenmore Street in the north side of Chicago. Her daughters both went to work in the morning, leaving Josephine at home alone, still sleeping. She woke up around 11 while Bill was already inside burglarizing her home. That's terrifying. I can't even... I, I'll Whenever we have story or uh, cases like this when they wake up with someone in your house that's that's terrifying just a nightmare it's so Hot horrible prowl. yeah scary although bill of course would credit his other personality george for the crime BSG. clearly <laughs> bill BSG. was in the house yes when he saw she was awake he attacked her with a knife stabbing her and then cutting her throat. After she was dead, he bathed her and cleaned her body, spending about two and a half hours closing her wounds. He used tape. He taped all of her cuts shut with adhesive tape. What? That's just a bizarre... It's very disturbing that he's trying to basically piece things back together again. Yeah. 
And I don't know if that just speaks to remorse or if that's an additional component to his fetish of taking someone's life and being in their house and stealing things. Like, I don't know if it's another sexual charge to stay and spend time with the body or if it's just because he wants to get rid of his regret. I tend to think that the first... Later, Bill would reflect on Josephine's murder, saying, quote, I wandered aimlessly from room to room, enjoying multiple orgasms. So clearly, he stuck around at least partially because it was a thrill to him. There's got to be an element of that. Yes, and I, I find it very bizarre that he's just wandering around with his pants off, just like ejaculating in hallways everywhere. Like, I, I mean, I guess... But it's just a very interesting visual. And then, you know, I know that you have got this thing where you keep thinking of him as B as G. One of the reasons that I am only specifically willing to talk about him as Bill is because he does recall these things. Exactly. How if do it you truly was an issue where George had done it, and we've talked about cases like this before, where someone sincerely doesn't remember... If you don't remember, then you wouldn't be able to say that you went through the house and you were coming everywhere. It just wouldn't be possible. So I know this is something confirming to me that he is Bill 100% of the time. George is something to blame. George is something he makes up. It is completely fictional and deliberate. It has nothing to do with the reality of his mental health. It's just him trying to get out of the responsibility for his actions, you know? Definitely. But if you go with what he's saying, this is Bill as George currently, right? But yeah, if you say that you remember these things, it blows the whole thing up. Exactly. So what are we doing here? But that's why he's not the credible source to me. No. So that's why it's like he's Bill to me and I'm only referring to him as Bill, period. Hey, how many people are you expecting? Relax, it's an open invite. I think you're a few seats short. Yeah, like four team seats. You should enter your eligible New York Lottery draw game tickets with Collect and Win. You could win a $5,000 gift card to use at the Home Depot and buy a bigger table to host. Hopefully they also sell chairs. The Home Depot is not a sponsor of this promotion. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. You must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served. Please play responsibly. Enter by 1720. We know the joy of giving is its own reward. But who says you can't get something for yourself, too? Now when you buy vanilla MasterCard gift cards, you can enter to win one of over 10 prizes every week for 10 weeks, including a grand prize of $10,000 in vanilla gift cards. So get gifting and start sharing the delight for more chances to win. Go to get-gifting.com to learn more and enter for your chance to win. Cards are issued by the Bancorp Bank and Metabank members at DIC pursuant to license by MasterCard International Incorporated and may be used in the U.S. everywhere debit MasterCard is accepted. Terms and conditions apply. Cards distributed and serviced by Income Financial Services, Inc., which is licensed as a money transmitter by the New York State Department of Financial Services and MLS ID number 912772. Six months later, in December 1945, Bill was walking the streets again looking for a home to burglarize. When he looked through a window and noticed a purse sitting on the table, the home was that of Francis Brown, a former telegrapher in the U.S. Navy who had become a stenographer. She lived alone and again awoke to the terrifying sound of someone inside her home. She looked up and saw Bill going through her purse, and then he saw her. So he instantly shot her, once in the head and once in the arm. When he saw that Francis was still alive, he grabbed a bread knife from the kitchen and stabbed her in the throat. As he'd done before with Josephine, he again cleaned her body, leaving her draped over the bathtub 
covered by a dress that sometimes referred to as a house coat in various sources. He took a tube of Francis's red lipstick and he wrote a message for the police on the wall. It read, quote, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Who is this note for, really? The police? Or the media? Or, like we talked about, trying to sensationalize things? If a murder happens, it's one thing. If there's, ooh, a, a note in lipstick, if there's a letter left, if there's ransom, it just escalates it. So you've got to wonder if he's trying to escalate it or if he really does feel like if he's not caught, he's going to do it again. Maybe. After writing the note on the wall, newspapers began releasing sensational headlines calling the murderer, quote, the lipstick killer. During the crime scene investigation, police found that the killer had wiped down the scene and only missed one fingerprint that was left on the door jamb. Because of the fingerprint, there was at least hope that when they do catch somebody, they'll have something to compare the suspect's prints to. That's more than they usually get in a lot of things. Exactly. Now, the other thing that's just whatever, here I am. Um, when he's writing this note, if you read it, because again, right, George won't confess to anything, but Bill is the one having the existential crisis of whether this is right or wrong. So this is, again, can, like, you're right, you know, it's Bill. It's not this George character. B is G is just what he says. You know, it's like, oh, well, I was George when I did this. But realistically, this is Bill. And that's another, like, the letter is another way to say it's Bill. To me, anyway. This is exactly. Exactly. Totally. I think people know. They can tell it's Courtney. They? <laughs> I think by now you have to know, right? So I don't know. My interpretation would be that it, yes, of course, points to Bill. But again, it makes it even more disbelievable, unbelievable. Yes. To blame it on George because he is writing these letters. Because it does, for me, give me reason to believe that he only wants to throw suspicion on someone else. You know what I mean? I think that this is one more reason for me to think that his biggest problem is lack of responsibility. And so if he writes this letter and says how bad and terrible he feels and he wants to be caught and, you know, just I don't want to be murdering basically is what he's saying. But if you don't catch me, it's going to happen and I can't control it. That's him taking no responsibility. Again, one more reason for me to think that Bill is full of shit. George doesn't exist. Yes. He's just making it up. You know, this is definitely one more confirmation for me that this alter ego is a complete fabrication. Beca and especially, you know, I think it's just it's offensive to people that are actually struggling with mental health to claim that you have something that you don't have you know true that and he's so insistent upon it he yes. really wants to you know blame it on george every time so yeah this note to me points more at him than any sort of split personality i agree less than a month later on the night of january 7th 1945 17 year old bill traveled to his parents house for dinner on the north side of Chicago. After dinner, he took the yell back to the south side where he was staying with a roommate while attending the University of Chicago. After studying at home for a bit, he decided to go back out. So he took the L again to the north side. The reason that he had returned to this neighborhood was because the night before, he had wandered to the neighborhood and robbed the apartment of Harry Gold. While he was in Harry's apartment, he had looked through the window and seen six-year-old Suzanne Dignan in the next building over while she was changing her clothes. So he's total, you know, skeeving out peeping Tom moment. Although this isn't something that we 
see consistently with him that he's a peeping Tom. I think there's an element to his burglary that involves looking in people's houses and feeling excited about looking into their lives. There's absolutely a peeping Tom element because how many times he sees a purse through a door, through a window, and then he goes to get the purse. It, it happens like almost all the times that he does burglary through a, like a just a door, like people just leave their doors open, I guess. I don't know. And just see it, reach in, grab it, and just run off. And he was able to do it a lot. Was just steal a purse right off of like, just open a door that was unlocked, look in, see the purse, grab it, and take off. And they never even knew that it was stolen until it was gone. And the peeping Tom thing, I mean, yeah, it, it, he does it through the entire time that he's doing it. And we typically think of peeping Toms as just specifically motivated by seeing nudity or people in sexual situations like that's what you normally associate peeping tom with yeah. is like looking at people and catching them at vulnerable moments but because it's clear that bill's kind of almost fetish is possessions like he's not necessarily sexually motivated by seeing someone naked usually usually just seeing a purse gives him a rush. He's looking to then, see what he can steal. Yeah, grabbing yeah. a purse or grabbing a coat makes him aroused. It's just the possessions to him that are kind of sexually fulfilling, it seems like, which we don't really see very often. But then, again, I think this is part of an escalation. While I've always previously gravitated towards possessions, now on this particular night, when he sees a partially clothed person it becomes that that person is sexualized, you know? I think this is like a an escalation process for him. Very nice. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, I think also that I have, there's never been a better argument for if you live in an apartment, man, fishbowl, keep those blinds closed. I was, I've just, yeah, I'm closing up everything all the time now, ever. Especially if it's dark outside and you have the lights on inside. People, please close your blinds. This, they're out there. I'm that same they're person. There, I'm man. constantly opening and closing the blinds, Me too. you know, based on angling the time of it. day. I'm angling it. Yeah. I'm very hyper aware of that fishbowl. Yeah. And then there's moments where you'll see, like, I'll be standing and I'll see at the apartment across. And I'm like, damn, I can see in there. And then you have this moment where you go, oh. <gasps> They can see me, too. Yeah. And I just get a little bit nervous. But, you know, paranoia, it is what it is. No, it freaks me out, too. I totally get it. And it's things like this. We do know that there's people out there looking in, you know? Yeah. Um. Yeah. And for him, that's part of the rush is looking into these houses. So when he was out that night and he looked in and he saw Susan Dignan dressing he decided then and there he was going to kidnap this child and he would not let her escape. His target, Suzanne, lived with her parents, Jim and Helen, and her younger sister, Betty, who attended Sacred Heart Academy with her. When Bill came back to find Suzanne the next night, he used a ladder from the yard to climb up to the second story. He then crawled into Suzanne's bedroom window. He carefully lifted her out of bed and then attempted to carry her to the window. When Suzanne woke up, Bill immediately set her on the floor and strangled her. After she had passed, he picked up her body and climbed out the window and down the ladder. He took her body to the basement of a nearby apartment complex and proceeded to dismember Suzanne into six individual pieces, four limbs, her torso, and her head. He disposed of the pieces in different sewer openings around the neighborhood believing that the pieces would quickly just be washed away by the water. Bill then returned to the basement and wrote a ransom letter with a lot of weird misspellings, pronunciation, weird off uh, lettering stuff. It's like if someone's trying to sound dumb. 
Yes. That's what I took from it. Honestly, that's a perfect observation. I hadn't even thought about yeah. it. It's like he knows he's college educated mm-hmm. and he wants to point the finger at someone that's, you know, quote unquote, working class or whatnot. Yes. He wants to say like in this um, typical kind of depiction of murders that we had throughout time like oh it was the janitor yes. it was the crazy janitor I feel like this note is really trying to send the police in that direction that's exactly it because we've got capitalization in the middle of words we've got you know the spelling all over the place so anyways it said gel which should be get but it's gel twenty thousand dollars ready misspelled And wait for word. Do not notify FBI or police. Bills in fives and tens. Burn this for her safety. Again, safety misspelled. It's written like that SpongeBob meme where he's got his hands on his hips. You know what I mean? With the capitalization. and Yeah, that's what it is. That's perfect. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. If you can picture that, I mean, it's just every like capital letter, every maybe three letters. It's a SpongeBob meme. (laughs) Yeah. The the spelling is off in a lot of the words. Extra letters like E at the end of wait. But again, you were right. Missing the E on safety. Like it's so stupidly simplified that it's it's the SpongeBob meme. You can tell, like Court said, it was on purpose to throw suspicion into someone that had less of an education, less of a reading writing background. He is completely trying to throw the scent somewhere else. And this also gives more. This takes away another aspect of BSG. Because he knows what he's doing. George wouldn't give a fuck. George is a straight killer. Right. Right? In his mind. Yeah. No, B is G. That's what this is. In his character development. Exactly. B is G reads B, H, and G too, I bet. But yeah, he's definitely, again, just throwing suspicion for me onto Bill not having any sort of George element to him. This also, with this case, this tells me, like, one thing I realized was this guy is really prowling because he's got, like, caches on roofs of ba- of buildings aside. He's got a basement area in a building across the street from a building in a neighborhood he doesn't live in. He puts in work prowling and, and going into unlocked doors and checking every, like, you know, the car doors to break in. He's checking every lock, everything. That's exactly true. I mean, it is clear that even though this is, you know, south side, north side, not where he lived. Completely opposite areas. He's taken trains around. Enough and looked at enough doors and just jiggled enough doorknobs to find the basement to take this girl to. And it's completely so premeditated. And again, one more time that you have to say There is no George, only Bill, because Bill is always prowling and he found this basement and he just knew one day he was going to find something bad to do there. Who knows? Maybe he originally intended to have another, you know, fur coat storage facility in this basement. And then this happened where he found Suzanne. That is pretty much where I was, too, is like he's just looking for places to hide things, you know, whatever it is. But again, there is no Dana, only Zool. George does not exist. Afterwards, he went back to the Dignan family apartment. Then he used the same ladder to climb back up to the window and toss the ransom note onto Suzanne's bed. Ballsy. Because how do you know that... How do you know they haven't found out she's missing yet? Exactly. And like they're freaking out in the house and then now you're up there with a freaking ladder throwing shit through the window? Go figure. He left the apartment and hurried back to his dorm. He cleaned himself up and then destroyed his soiled jacket. The following day, he attended two of his three classes as though it was just a regular day. I just can't imagine going on about your life as though you didn't just murder someone the night before. If you're going to keep up the story that you are BSG... B would, you know, he's just going to continue going because he doesn't remember what George has done. In the morning, back at the Dignan's apartment, Suzanne's father, Jim, went to wake her up for school 
and saw that the bedroom curtains were blowing in the icy air because the window was still open. He immediately realized Suzanne wasn't there and then saw the ransom note. Police began a search of the neighborhood and soon found various pieces of Suzanne's body. Her leg was found in an alley, the torso and other leg in the drains. Her arms were found a month later in a sewer after the family had already held a service and buried their daughter. That's so sad. It's so tragic. Medical examiners would describe the manner in which she was dismembered as surgically precise. Soon after... An anonymous call gave the police a tip to look into a particular sewer drain, so two detectives were sent out to check it out. They quickly noticed a drain cover sitting strangely, and when they lifted it to check why, they believed that they were seeing a doll's head, but it turned out to be Suzanne's head. Several people in the neighborhood said they'd seen a man. Some reports were of a woman carrying a bundle in the area, but none of these leads yielded any suspects. Clear fingerprints were found on the ransom note, so of course they hoped to find a suspect to match them with. Chicago's mayor at the time also received a letter that said, quote, this is to tell you how sorry I am not to get old Dignan instead of his girl. Roosevelt and the OPA made their own laws. Why shouldn't I and a lot more? There'd recently been a strike related to the meat packers in Chicago, and there had recently been a retaliation murder involving a decapitation. So this kind of made the police consider that maybe the murder was related since Mr. Dignan was a senior executive in the industry. They thought maybe this was kind of going back and forth retaliation. Someone just came after his daughter. That tells me like they're working leads. They're working everything. Yeah, looking at every angle. Yeah, they're trying. Because there was grease on the ransom note, detectives made an assumption that someone, quote, like a janitor who would have had dirty hands would have been the perpetrator. And again, you know, this just plays in directly to what Bill himself has set out to create this illusion that it's this working class guy, dirty hands. I think that this was this was by design. Of course. Based on that detail, they accused a 65-year-old man named Hector Verberg of the crimes. He was arrested and beaten by police for 48 hours. He even suffered a separated shoulder, but he still refused to confess to the murder. While in the hospital, it was determined that he could barely read or write, so he could not have written the notes that were left by the killer. That's interesting to me because you would, he's assuming that you're going to find this janitor, right, that can read and write, but he didn't think about, like, if you're a janitor, there's a great possibility at this time that you can't read or write, so it's a very interesting, like, argument that B is G, right? He's, like, trying to perpetuate that, oh, it's somebody else, but he just fucks it up. I just found that interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think he's trying to throw suspicion on someone that has a not great reading writing ability. But you're right. He doesn't think of the factor that it's not necessarily a given that all people will be able to read or write. So there's a possibility that they'll bring in someone that's working class that doesn't have that ability. Yeah. You know? Hector later sued the Chicago police and won $20,000 in the suit, which would be over $260,000 today. That means they they were fucking, they fucked him up is what I'm trying to say here. They knew they were wrong. 
And even when we talk about old timey cases, mm-hmm. I mean, it strikes a big flag to me that they even awarded him any money. Oh, yeah. Because they definitely weren't about taking responsibility at the time. Police were just a bunch of angry, batons. retaliatory. They were angry batons, is <laughs> what they were. They were just a sea of batons kicking the shit out of people, and they didn't get in trouble for it. So. To have to pay money to a janitor in Chicago. You fucked up. Big yeah, time. It didn't really seem like a time where they held back at all. There was a no. lot of people that were victims of violence by the police. And so it just constantly went unchecked and there were no lawsuits about it. So the fact that this went to a lawsuit, it went through and a judge awarded him money speaks volumes about the severity of what Hector went through. Yeah. Hey, how many people are you expecting? Relax, it's an open invite. I think you're a few seats short. Yeah, like four teen seats. You should enter your eligible New York lottery draw game tickets with Collect and Win. You could win a $5,000 gift card to use at the Home Depot and buy a bigger table to host. Hopefully they also sell chairs. The Home Depot is not a sponsor of this promotion. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. You must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served. Please play responsibly. Enter by 1720. We know the joy of giving is its own reward. But who says you can't get something for yourself, too? Now when you buy vanilla MasterCard gift cards, you can enter to win one of over 10 prizes every week for 10 weeks, including a grand prize of $10,000 in vanilla gift cards. So get gifting and start sharing the delight for more chances to win. Go to get-gifting.com to learn more and enter for your chance to win. Cards are issued by the Bancorp Bank and MetaBank members FDIC pursuant to license by MasterCard International Incorporated and may be used in the U.S. everywhere debit MasterCard is accepted. Terms and conditions apply. Cards distributed and serviced by Income Financial Services, Inc., which is licensed as a money transmitter by the New York State Department of Financial Services and MLS ID number 912772. During this time, there were also false confessions from inmates. There were false leads from a handkerchief that had been stolen and phone calls that were found to just be pranks done by kids. Multiple times, the police took someone in front of the media and declared them to be the one that did it, only to later find that they were not the suspect. Oh, they did this over and over again. It was like two to three times. And then you just eventually, when this happens, you just stop believing this, right? Right. It's a boy who cried wolf thing. It's like, yeah, you've shown us 15 suspects in the last year. I'm not going to believe you now. The case stalled and for several months, nothing new came in. And the cops were heavily criticized for the mishandling of the case and not being able to get it solved. The entire city was in fear, and people would refer to this night, the one that Suzanne Dignan was murdered, as, quote, the night Chicago locked its doors. So there were a lot of people just knowing that this was still unsolved, the perpetrator was still out there, and could come attack them or their kids at any time. Yeah. On June 26, 1946... 17-year-old Bill was going through an apartment building looking for unlocked doors. Once he found one, he entered and spotted a purse sitting on a cabinet. He grabbed the purse and bolted for the door. But on his way out, he was spotted by a neighbor from across the hall. A janitor gave chase and blocked Bill's only exit so bill pointed his gun at him and said let me get out or i'll let you have it in the guts and then he took off running down the street a neighbor called the police while this was happening and officers soon showed up and began chasing him they finally closed in on him in a staircase There was one officer that was above him on the stairs, and then another officer below him. Bill aimed his gun on the officer, Tiflin Constant, who was below him on the stairs, and he pulled the trigger. 
the gun misfired twice. So in a panic, Bill just threw the gun at the officer, Tiffin Constant, just to try and stop him as a last ditch effort. Man, you're, that gun misfired twice. Like, that's the story you tell when you're a grandparent. Just like, I'm like, pointed it in. It misfired twice, and I'm here alive to tell you about it, right? <laughs> the officer ducked, and Bill lunged forward, knocking the gun out of officer's hand because he realized a hand-to-hand fight was his only way to get out of the stairwell. An off-duty officer named Abner Cunningham suddenly showed up at the top of the stairs just in a pair of swim trunks. He was just casually going about his day, hears this commotion and comes out to try and help, right? Yeah. And he really didn't have anything with him. I mean, he's not carrying a gun in his swim trunks, so he had to think fast. And he grabbed some flower pots and started dropping them down aiming for Bill. He was actually able to accurately hit him three times, which left him unconscious and needing stitches after the ordeal. This is the scene that I want to see in the movie. This is the old-timey case stuff. It's just like, yeah, I dropped these flower pots on his head. I got some flower pots. It's cartoonish, you know? It's it's really great to see it visually in your head. I would love to see a movie take this. Martin Scorsese can do this story. That would be fun. That would be a good one. It'd be four hours long. Yeah, it's just unreal to me that there were people stepping in. But again, like we said, this was the night that Chicago locked its doors. So the idea that they're closing in on this perp, people are coming out of the woodwork, coming out of their doors and saying, how can I help? You know, what can I do? We got to catch this guy. So after Bill passed out, Bill was taken to the hospital where he says he was vaguely in and out of consciousness the entire time. But he felt someone take his fingerprints while he was cuffed to the hospital bed. When Bill was arrested, he had a letter in his pocket. He said it was from George M.S. in El Paso, Texas. In it, George says, quote, tough luck that Bill was sent to jail and he's headed to Milwaukee and thinks his burglary gang will break up. The letter goes on to warn Bill to, quote, burn what you have from any burglaries and signs off saying he'll see him soon. I think it's so interesting that George is able to write to Bill and that George has all this kind of advice for Bill and they know each other. Because there's many times with multiple personality, all the, you know, like old timey double split personality, they have, you know, and again, he even said there's no recollection whatsoever. So how does this letter, like how is George writing to Bill when Bill has no memory of anything George does? And it would probably be vice versa as well, right? So it kind of, to me, breaks his argument down even more when this letter appears. And I love that George is just, tough luck. That was some shit. I'm out of here to the Alamo. Like, what? Why is he in Texas in any way? Yeah, I just feel like this speaks so much to Bill's premeditation that he's constantly like, well, if I'm caught, I'm going to have this letter in my pocket. Yeah. And then I can use my George defense, you know? B is G. And it's just so, it's bullshit. Yes. It's 100% bullshit. Investigators quickly determined that Bill wrote the letter himself. After his arrest, his parents and his little brother changed their last names to Hill to avoid connection. And then his parents got divorced. It's about time. Bill was interrogated for six days straight without adequate food and water. He was also given a lumbar puncture and multiple polygraphs during the process without access to a lawyer or his parents for any consent to speak to their son, who was still a minor. Bill said he was punched in the testicles repeatedly, causing him to vomit, and he was kicked in the stomach when he would not confess to the crimes. 
Bill was administered sodium pentothal, or truth serum, during an attempt to interrogate him while under the influence. Only a few years later after this, using truth serum would become inadmissible in court, but at this time, it was still used as a technique to elicit a confession. While on the truth serum, he mentioned that George Merman may be responsible for the crimes. It's possible. There's this guy, George. He may have done this. Right. Like, what? He also said that the stolen items found in the search of his dorm at Gates Hall were from burglaries that George had committed, and then Bill only had the items because George had given them to him to hide. But it seems very weird that he talks about George like it's another part of him, like it's a personality, but then he also talks about him like it's another person that he knows. Yes. He can't ever really get that right. Like it's a person that he's seen in real life. Yes. Like it's, I, I don't know. He's just really using this as an excuse and not really thinking it through on how to do that, quote, right. It's not a streamlined argument. No. One item recovered was a stolen scrapbook from Harry Gold's apartment that contained pictures of many different Nazi officials. The scrapbook brought even more suspicion upon Bill because it essentially proved that he'd been in the building right next door to the Dignan family. Bill eventually confessed to over 300 burglaries. Days after confessing, Bill said that his confession was coerced. And it sounds like there is, you know, a bit of an argument for that. He was severely mistreated and deprived his basic rights. But essentially, it seems like we know for so many other reasons that he did it. It's definitely not okay that they treated him that way and that they were violent towards him. But I definitely don't think this was a coerced confession. No. I don't either. Chicago's crime detection lab tested the ransom note, the fingerprints found on it, and the door jam fingerprints, and they concluded that they were all a match to Bill. Bill's defense attorneys never raised any issue with the fingerprint results and never brought in their own experts to confirm the tests themselves. Because of the physical evidence against him, Bill was more swayed towards confessing since the fingerprints were a match. I think knowing all of that information, he really just had to say, yeah, I did it. The physical evidence was there. What do you do when your fingerprints are at multiple murder scenes and you don't know these people? It's really like a kid that walks into the kitchen. He's got chocolate all over his face and he's like, I didn't eat the candy. You have to just say, yeah, I did it, you know? George did it. (laughs) George ate the candy. He just put it on my face. He rubbed it all over my face, and now he's on his way to Milwaukee with his burglary gang. According to the handwriting experts, the writing from the ransom letter and the lipstick note on the wall matched Bill's handwriting. When he was faced with 29 indictments, he reportedly laughed and said to the police, are there any more? I swear, murderers have the stupidest jokes. They think they're, they're like so dad funny. Jokes. Yeah, yeah, they think they're so funny. And they all say that when they bring the indictments. They all, what was, oh my God, we just did it for Jay. I can't remember his name, but he did the same thing. They gave him like 30 indictments or whatever, and he just he goes, oh, is that all? Hyrule, Charles Harrelson, Harrelson's, Woody Harrelson's dad, did the same shit. Oh, it's so funny. Same dad joke. You got more? Yeah, they're just trying to make light and crack jokes. And yeah, of course, for Ted Bundy, that kind of stuff worked. But for everyone else, it's just annoying. (laughs) You know? Oh, God. The media portrayed Bill as this sort of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde figure. And they showed him on newspaper covers as two men. Yeah, this was also like the height of, you know, sensationalism journalism. And when you see the pictures it's very um very graphic very you know like 
uh, Universal Studios old monsters. Mm. The Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's it's very sensationalized, and they just had this story that fit this so well. It just happened to work out. There was an eyewitness, George Subgrunsky, who claimed that he had seen a figure the night of Suzanne's murder carrying a shopping bag. When shown a picture of Bill, George said that he was the man he'd seen that night but he was later discredited when details of his story started changing. Facing a forensics match, handwriting evidence, and an eyewitness, it seemed certain, of course, that Bill would be found guilty. In 1946, a guilty verdict would likely result in a death sentence and certainly meant that the state would actually kill him. This isn't a 2019 California death sentence. Right, where you probably have 20 years and then you'll just get sick. I mean, this was something that was looming over his head. He probably would be killed. Oh, you'll get the chair. It seems a lot safer to give a confession, take a plea deal, and then he'd be able to avoid the electric chair. State Attorney William Toohey presented a plea deal that required a full confession to all three murders, as well as a reenactment of each crime, which brought the crowds in droves to watch the Dignan reenactment. Again, like you referenced earlier, it's the height of this sensationalism journalism. And there's this thing that's going on right now where people basically think that true crime is like a brand new phenomenon. Isn't that funny? Like, it's always been here. Where have you been? It's so strange to me that people think that think because it's, it's always existed. I yeah. mean, I just, journalism ethics exist because people were so unethical in previous reporting of cases where people were just treating it as entertainment, that they were sensationalizing it. But I mean, people have, from the beginning of time, attended public executions they've been packing the crowds come in droves for these trials and you can't fit anyone in the courtroom I mean it's always been popular it's always drawn people in people have always been fascinated but this is one of those cases that's clear evidence of that where people just had to come see the reenactments on August 7th 1946 Bill accepted the deal, and he confessed to every burglary and murder charge. During the confession, he also said he threw the knife he used on Suzanne Dignan off an elevated subway track near the crime scene, which was previously unknown information. When this was discovered, rail crews near the Granville station realized they had actually found a knife from months before, and they were just keeping it in their storage shed. It was a random thing that was recovered. They had no idea it was evidence. And he gave them that information. Exactly. So now you try to tell me, B is G, right? Any of it. You try to tell me someone else did this. There's no way. It was discovered that the knife was stolen from the same nearby apartment as the gun that was found on Bill. The night he signed the deal, Bill tried to hang himself in the cell, but officers found him and were able to revive him. On September 5th, he was sentenced to three life terms. But again, taking the plea, he was able to avoid the death penalty. And he's like 18 now. Right. I mean, he's so young. The thing that struck me, I got almost all the way through this, and towards the end I realized, we're still talking about a teenager. I forgot. I always come into these cases and we're like, okay, he's 35, he's 40, but this was a young, young kid. Yeah. Yeah. So after the plea deal, there were a lot of people that came forward that proclaimed his innocence. There was a lot of argument back and forth. And people that would say, uh, you know, the fingerprint evidence wasn't enough, that they took it without his consent. Of course, they went into the coerced confession because he had been deprived food and water. He had been actually 
uh, victimized and, you know, they used violence against him. I don't know. I mean, there's there's a lot there if you want to dive into it, if you want to look at the articles in our resources or if you want to read the the articles there and the links. Yeah, you I can think... go ahead and do that. But I don't know. There's not much to dive into as far as I'm concerned because we know we have evidence that matched him. The knife is a big deal to me. Me too. That he had these details that only the person that perpetrated the, tr- the crimes could have known. And on top of that, we don't have any other lipstick murders after he's put in jail. This is true. So if you want to take a dive into some of the arguments for his innocence, totally go ahead and look into that. But I don't think it's worth spending too much time on just because there's so many other things that point out the fact that he's the only one that could have done this. Yes. Bill began serving his time at Stateville Prison in Joliet, Illinois, where he learned electronic repair. In 1953, a book called The Bloody Spur was written by Charles Einstein about Bill's case, and it eventually became the 1956 Fritz Lang film While the City Sleeps. In 1972, he became the first prisoner in Illinois history to earn a four-year bachelor degree. He was nothing but, if nothing else, smart all along. So that doesn't really surprise me because he's so smart that he has to keep his brain going or else it's just chaos. Right. And again, him being so smart is another reason that I think he would make up this alter ego because he's smart enough to say, let me blame mental health, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And it's also another argument like we've seen in the psychology of killers that write letters I mean, it makes sense that he wants to outsmart the police, prove that he's more intelligent. You know, that's definitely a highly motivating factor for killers that write letters. He managed the prison's garment shop for five years. And then when he was transferred to another facility, Bill set up the entire educational program overseeing their GED process. So he got really involved, and he was kind of seems like trying to help people. Sounds like he would have probably been a great teacher. Yeah, and he's using his intelligence for good. Mm -hmm. He was also known as the jailhouse lawyer, and he helped his fellow inmates with their appeals process. By 1965, he was given parole on one of his life sentences. So, in 1966, after 20 years in prison, he began serving his second life sentence. According to his 1946 sentencing, he would have been done serving the sentence for Josephine by 1975, and done with the remaining charges by 1983. That's crazy, but, I mean... It... It's three life sentences. How do you get out? But he was able to, you know, get, quote unquote, get parole. So you have to let him out, right? It's just. Yeah, it's, but it's just, it is very like, how does that Wait, happen? <laughs> you know? But during the 70s, focus in the Illinois prison system shifted from rehabilitation to punishment which meant that Bill would have little chance of getting out. So they clearly changed their tune, where they wanted to really stick to their sentences, make sure that the criminals paid for their crimes. They voted someone new in. He transferred to a minimum security prison at 47 years old in 1975. And then in 1988, At 60 years old, he transferred to a minimum security prison in Dixon, Illinois, where he lived in the hospital due to complications of his diabetes. In 1983, Bill began preparing for his release by getting a trailer and finding a job at an orchard. I mean, he's he's confident enough. He's making plans for when he gets out. That's pretty bizarre when you have three life sentences. 
Yeah, it's something that I've never heard of in the cases that we covered. Never. Where there's multiple life sentences and people are planning like, oh, I've got this job. I got this place to live. I got this bitch and trailer. It He's doesn't prepping. happen. It's weird. When Suzanne Dignan's sister found out about this upcoming release, she tried to fight it by getting signatures with the help of former police and petitioning local government to pass resolutions against his parole. In 1984, the U.S. Appeals Court reversed their decision denying Bill parole. In 1990, an appeals judge stated that just as most involved with the case were dead, so are his hopes for release from prison. It's quite a statement, right? In 2002, a petition for clemency for Bill was filed, but the appeal was denied. At the hearing, the defense questioned whether the fingerprint match of the ransom note could be considered valid at this time since Tui was the one who had asserted they matched, and it was never challenged. His defense attorneys never challenged anything, which is very bizarre in a triple murder case there is no scientific you know validation there's nothing on their end and that is why so many people were able to say hey he might be innocent or new attorneys that want to make a name for themselves would come in solicit him like hey let me help on your case and this is why we kept seeing people trying to make him innocent right there were so many people that were arguing that I think based on simply just his defense team not really fighting for yes, him. Yes, that's exactly it. You know, I, and I think that no matter what, even though I firmly agree with him being guilty and I just know in my heart he did it, it still does not sit right with me that his defense attorneys didn't work harder for him. Yeah. You know, I think that, I mean, the justice system exists because we need fairness. We need people to have representation and they clearly didn't represent him to the best of their abilities no in 2003 former la cop steve hodell we know from the hodell family if you're familiar with some of the theories in the black dahlia case yes right so hodell was investigating the murders and found that he believed bill to be innocent he wrote a letter to the illinois prison review board in bill's favor so there's a lot of people fighting for his innocence. I don't see it, but I, you know, I really like Steve Hodel. I'd be curious to see what his thoughts are. I was thinking the same. I'm like, I want to read whatever. I'm sure he's written something about it. Yeah. I, I want to know why he thinks that. Exactly. It just doesn't seem like there's any credible reason to me that would make me think there's any sort of hope for innocence. Yeah. But... Again, I'd be curious just because Steve Hodell is a really great detective. He's really smart and I think he's very fair and balanced. I just think that it would be interesting to see what he said. Yeah. The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Ooh, the moon. Yeah. That's Hugo, tickling the ivories. He just saved by bundling home and auto with Progressive. Gonna finally buy a ring for that gal of yours, Hugo? Send her my condolences. hi -o! This next one's for you, too. There's a burglar in my heart. Thank you. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations. We know the joy of giving is its own reward. But who says you can't get something for yourself, too? Now when you buy vanilla Visa gift cards, you can enter to win one of over 10 prizes every week for 10 weeks, including a grand prize of $10,000 in vanilla gift cards. So get gifting and start sharing the delight for more chances to win. Go to get-gifting.com to learn more and enter for your chance to win. Cards are issued by the Bank Court Bank, Meta Bank, and Sutton Bank, members FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc., and may be used in the U.S. everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Terms and conditions apply. Cards distributed and serviced by Income Financial Services Inc., which is licensed as a money transmitter by the New York State Department of Financial Services. NMLS ID number 912772. By his 30th and last parole hearing, it was July 2007, 
and his parole was denied by a 14 to 0 vote. And he was told, quote, God will forgive you, but the state won't. Truer words have never been spoken. That's the deepest thing. Like, it's a very deep statement. In May 2008, JQ's Adam Higginbotham did a profile on Bill. And at the time, he was the longest serving inmate in the U.S. prison system, making him probably pretty fascinating. He'd seen a lot go on while he was behind bars. We know how much culture advances in that span of time. So prison culture must be completely different. The facilities must be different, right? The type of criminals must be different. So he'd seen a lot and they profiled him. Bill expressed that he did expect to get out sometime soon, that he'd like to travel on a transcontinental railroad trip and to finally try lobster. But yeah, that seems like something he's just trying to give himself hope, like, oh, one day I'm going to do these things. You've got to have that to keep going. I'm going to move into this trailer. Right. And I'm going to eat lobster. After and, uh, so many years, it's those little things you want to do. I'm going to go on the Polar Express. Bill lamented that he wasn't able to get into the pizza business as it was just starting to take off at the time he was imprisoned. And he knew his life had been wasted and that it had, it had been his own fault. This makes me like I was thinking about this when I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, 1940. 546, this is Chicago deep dish. That's what's going on here. Yeah. And he probably wanted to make himself a pizza oven. Who knows, maybe his drunk dad and him had plans. You know what I mean? Like something just, oh, I want to open a pizza place. He really regretted that. That's where his mind went, you know? And I think that's interesting. I mean, he looks at what he would have done. But at the same time, it's like, I don't have sympathy. The only one that kept you from your goals and dreams was you, You took multiple people's lives. Fuck you and your pizza, you know? No, for sure. But yeah, that was the thing that he regretted. Like, oh, I should have made some deep dish. Should have had pizza. (laughs) Should have tried lobster. Two or three times a year, old high school classmates would make the trip to Dixon to see Bill. But most of those who would previously visit him were dead by this point. Yeah, definitely. On March 5th, 2012, Bill died from complications from his diabetes at 83 years old after serving 65 years on his three life sentences. This case just went on and on because he lived so long. He was convicted so young and he died at 83 years old. It's just, it, it's a very very detailed, very long. And then you have people trying to say he's innocent and all these different things. This was just a very long case. It is something that stands out about him is that he lived so long and was so young during his conviction. And I think that I didn't really realize that till way far into researching. It doesn't seem normal. It seems highly out of the ordinary that a 17-year-old would have already committed multiple murders you know but yeah this is something that makes him stand out there's so many factors to this case that make him unique it's his age it's the letter writing it's the amount of time that he served in prison that was so high and there's also like there's the whole letter aspect right and then but then there's an entire secondary side of having a split personality on top of this that could be a case on its own There's a lot of things that came together on this one that you don't see together a lot. It's very interesting, but it is very long and drawn out. I think it's also interesting, too, that Josephine Ross's daughter, she specified and said that she didn't necessarily believe that he was the killer because, in her mind, he didn't match what she had an idea of who would have been the killer of her mother. But that is not a real thing. There is no such thing as the person in your mind that you think would be the killer not matching. Therefore, they're innocent. But just that there were questions from every angle 
even from the victim's family yeah. member, it does stand out that that is very unique. But I think, you know, I feel bad saying this because she's a family member, but I definitely disagree. I think that he's just a very unique killer. We don't normally see a killer that age. We don't normally see someone that just is a regular small time burglar during this era because there were a lot of burglars just trying to make ends meet, yeah. trying to really get out of poverty. We don't see that escalate to murder a lot of times. So he didn't fit any sort of profile. He was highly unordinary. Just, I don't know. He He doesn't fit the mold. So I understand why she would think like, well, that doesn't fit the picture of what I thought it was, but it doesn't fit any sort of typical criteria that we see. So it's normal for her to think that, but it's also kind of like, well, he's just different altogether. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, I give him absolutely zero leeway for a lot of things. And I think that he was intelligent and I think that there really shouldn't be any discussion of his mental illness or schizophrenia or any multiple personalities because it's just a lie that this is just him lying and I refuse to give any credit to what he says about George you know it just pisses me off that the whole time he's trying to make excuses for himself and blame this other entity that doesn't exist you know I just uh Obviously, I'm never going to respect a murderer, but I have more respect for someone that's honest and said, I fucked up and I feel regret than someone that's constantly trying to make it seem like someone else did it. You know, he's just a, a murderer and a liar on top of it. It just made me so furious the whole time that I'm like listening him talk about this George character that doesn't exist. It just made me angry every time he brought it up because it's just a cop out. It's just him trying to not take responsibility. I don't know. I just kind of go to this place, too, where he's smart enough to know that there is an argument. For example, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It came out in 1920, Robert Louis Stevenson movie. He's born in 28, so he's a young kid probably watching reruns of old movies, right? And, like, knowing that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is split personality, it's a thing. You can actually get away with this, right? You can use this as an excuse. I, I just feel like he thought he was smart enough that he would be able to get away with this and just live in some minimum security place or just live at some hospital, right? Because this exists, yeah, he was absolutely that person that was smart enough to use that as part of his premeditation. Yeah. And to go so far with that premeditation that he would carry a letter with him, that he would make up a f different kind of writing to use, you know, to misspell things. I mean, yeah, this was like, I know that there's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I'm going to use that. You know, you're totally yeah. right. You hit the nail on the head. Of course, He's just like, this is something that I can use to get away with murder. And you need to carry a note around from G if you're going to be B as G to solidify this argument. And I really do think you can you can totally enter uh, with, I don't know, you can just use these in conjunction together, whatever. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is the same thing as B and G. B as G is the same thing to me. And it's just his argument. That's all. It was just fun to keep saying B as G. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, he honestly, really went every for that. time you say it, I'm like, that's such a court thing. This yeah. is like, I you saying B as G is court in front of the whiteboard conspiracy thing. It's the yeah, it is because completely. it's just there's so many little lines in to draw with B as G. You can just jump all over, <laughs> and then you've got Doctor J and H. You know, right? it's, it's it's all the same. It's Having just a field day with that yarn. So much yarn. <laughs> clipboards all of it so yeah that's our next letter case william hirons yeah and we're actually it feels like it went by really quickly but we've only got one more letter case to dive into next week it's a wild one and then we're moving on it feels like this one happened really fast i'm telling you right now i have spent a lot of time with william hirons right and <laughs> i'm done he lived forever and it just kept going. The funny thing is, is 
we would talk in between while you're sitting there and researching this. And I'm like, how's this going? And or you just text me out of the blue, just like, I want this man to die already because I'm done writing about him. It was like 53 and he's doing this and then it's 66. And then I get I'm like, wait, 88. Like, I'm alive now at this point. (laughs) And he is, too. Right. Crazy. So anyway, this was fun. And there was so much that you had found on him that so we much. just had to cut out a lot of stuff because it was just too much. Like we pride ourselves on our research and deep diving, but even William Hirons was too much for us. We could do a whole nother episode just on the conspiracies of his innocence. Right. And just the defense attorneys that would come out of the woodwork here and there and be like, let's try it again. And I can get my name and lights somewhere. That could be a Because Patreon, I got him innocent, you know. Now that I think about That's it. That's a good point. We could do that. There's so much. If anybody even cares to hear it, let us know. We can Patreon that shit. Right. But damn. So, yeah, that's the end of that. We're going to jump into a new one next time. And before we get out of here, we just want to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you like all the research and stuff that we got into and you appreciate what's going on, then definitely uh, follow us so you can get more information and breaking news and some memes and stuff like that. Feel free to leave us a five-star review. Yes, we always appreciate your reviews. And if you want to get some perks and bonus episodes and ad-free episodes, then join our Patreon at patreon.com slash murder dictionary. We've got a few people to thank before we get out of here. So thank you to Martha, Kimberly, Charmaine, and Kat for being new on our Patreon. Thank you again. Thanks, you guys. We really appreciate you. It means so much. All, you know, the supporters on Patreon, the reviews, just you guys following us. We can't thank you enough for being a supporter of the show. We can't thank you enough for being a part of this and listening and following us and being involved. We really, really are grateful for you guys. So that's pretty much it for us this week. We hope you have a wonderful week and we will see you next time. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, have a fun Black Friday. Oh, my goodness. That's Court's Day. Oh, yeah. How much Bath and Body Works did you buy last time? Well, just so you all know, I don't know if everyone knows this. December um, 7th is the candle sale. (laughs) Just so you know, when they are $8.95 instead of $34.95 a piece. Court is all over it. So we hope you enjoy your holiday. Have fun with your friends and family and enjoy your shopping on Black Friday. And we will see you next time. See ya. Bye. We all have songs that remind us of our first love and bands that make us think of a certain friend. Maybe you have a workout playlist or a favorite album to listen to on road trips. But do you ever wonder what was going on in the lives of the artist when they wrote the music that you connect to your own memories? Rockumentary Podcast fills in the blanks on what you may not know about the iconic artists making the music that's so meaningful to our own lives. Each episode is an in-depth biography spanning from musicians' childhood through all the challenges of their journey to success and how they handled finally achieving fame. On Rockumentary, you'll hear about Kurt Cobain becoming a janitor at the same high school that he dropped out of, or how Jimi Hendrix was kidnapped and held for ransom for two days. Our episodes include details about Notorious B.I.G. marrying Faith Evans after knowing her for only a week and Phil Spector pulling a gun on the Ramones when they tried to end a long recording session. You may know the music, but on Rockumentary, you'll hear the stories behind the songs. Search for Rockumentary on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you like to listen to podcasts.
Hey, how many people are you expecting? Relax, it's an open invite. I think you're a few seats short. Yeah, like four team seats. You should enter your eligible New York lottery draw game tickets with Collect and Win. You could win a $5,000 gift card to use at the Home Depot and buy a bigger table to host. Hopefully they also sell chairs. The Home Depot is not a sponsor of this promotion. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. You must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served. Please play responsibly. And by 1720. We know the joy of giving is its own reward. But who says you can't get something for yourself, too? Now when you buy vanilla MasterCard gift cards, you can enter to win one of over 10 prizes every week for 10 weeks, including a grand prize of $10,000 in vanilla gift cards. So get gifting and start sharing the delight for more chances to win. Go to get-gifting.com to learn more and enter for your chance to win. Cards are issued by the Bancorp Bank and MetaBank members at DIC pursuant to license by MasterCard International Incorporated and may be used in the U.S. everywhere debit MasterCard is accepted. Terms and conditions apply. Cards distributed and serviced by Income Financial Services, Inc., which is licensed as a money transmitter by the New York State Department of Financial Services and MLS ID number 912772.